Welcome back. Next up, we've got an automotive use case using Tanzu Application Service as an integration platform from our friends at Deloitte. I'd like to welcome Manoj and Siddharth from Deloitte to the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Siddharth Marutra, uh, go by Sid. I'm a senior manager at Deloitte and uh, my area of expertise primarily being cloud strategy and transformation uh, and primarily looking at uh, systems which actually are for high throughput, low latencies and the areas of DevOps, SRE and blockchain. I also hold a couple of patents uh, in uh, US and other countries. Along with me is my colleague Manoj. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Manoj Tekumprat. Uh, I'm a senior manager with uh, Lloyd Consulting. I'm part of the cloud practice, uh, and I always uh, said focus on uh, specializing on basically architecting and delivering uh, enterprise applications uh, for our healthcare, public sector, and commercial clients uh, using cloud native technologies. Thank you. So moving on. It, uh, the primary use case, a, a, a client here is a, a large automotive, automobile manufacturing firm, one of the largest in the world. And uh, they had, uh, they approached us primarily with a problem of streamlining their enterprise resource planning platform. When we look at ERP, which is basically the key name that you see in the deck, IERP, that is Integrated Resource Planning. And the primary exercise out here was, was to drive efficiencies, uh, not just from consolidating the general ledgers and uh, creating uh, a, a consolidated view of the financial uh, statements at the end of the quarter or end every month, but also to um, build out uh, an efficiency with respect to their uh, procurement process. Right? Now, uh, procurement, which is a pretty much a most complicated uh, way of, of uh, maintaining the supply chain for any of these uh, organizations, it has to be just in time. And add to add the complexity of uh, COVID hitting in where uh, cost reduction is was the primary prerogative out there. Uh, looking at that, they wanted to realize efficiencies uh, that would impact approximately 7,000 odd employees. Uh, the systems were segregated into various legacy systems. Now, these are these are organizations which actually have been building cars uh, and other automotive uh, vehicles for a very long time. So the systems have been built over the period of time. They have legacy systems which have different means of, uh, of interaction. Some are FTP-based, some are file-based. Uh, some would have been modernized or we could say cloud friendly, right? And bringing all of that together, aligning about close to about 440 to 450 processes, right? Using industry standards and aligning, also aligning that with the regulatory standards. Now consider this, that this particular firm is a global firm. So they have standards that they have to align and adhere to across various countries. And that also has to be taken into account as and when the systems are being uh, built out and, uh, and matured, right? Some of the key, Non-technical imperatives that we had uh, was, uh, first is basically it has to fit with the legacy fitment, which means that when the system goes live, A, the legacy system has to work the way it is, and that is the fallback mechanism, right? And when I'm talking about fallback, I'm not talking about DR, high availability, or fault tolerance. Those are, those are different things, but basically it has to have a fitment with legacy. Uh, the While we were doing that, we also had to take into account the cultural implications in mind, right? Every organization, every business unit has a different way and, and maturity of regarding the processes. They have their own understanding. Bringing all of them together, that's where the agile transformation and the, pro and the program governance came into the picture, which will go in subsequent slides of how we drive PI plannings, how do we do a uh, uh, productized development by dividing those individual PI into subsections and creating each and every one as a product, right? And then eventually, basically having the simplicity in the system by which they can have real-time analytics, right? Be able to identify where the money is going, how the money is going, how it is being consumed, right? And last but not the least, right? The, the system, the volume that this particular integrated platform is supposed to handle would be anywhere between 60 to 50, 60 to 85 million transactions on a daily and had to integrate across 650 to 700 odd systems, right? And that had to get consolidated into uh, their target uh, platform of choice for PRP, which was as for HANA in this case. Okay. 
So uh, although the, uh, the, uh, the slide talks about technical challenges now, remember the fact that the technical challenges don't just align or come out because of the systems which are legacy, because that's pretty, that is pretty apparent. Here in this case, the technical challenges also comes, comes across or that you have to bring out these different units together. These units are not just located in US. They are, they are the business units are spread across the world. Everybody has, as I was talking about, their own regulatory practices, right? So to enable these transformations, right? What we did was we leveraged a product-based model. Each group was identified and, and, and kept into a different PDOs, which is the productized organizations. At the same time, right? There was a horizontal spread of an agile release train, which were having their own continuous spikes to find out solutions and patterns that will fit and give efficiencies as the PDOs embark into the, uh, into the, into the space. Now, on the technical side, each interface, when it, when it talked about that, about, about 400 odd systems and 650, uh, 650 different interfaces that basically interact with each other as a part of the solution, they each have a different functional and data elements. When I talk about data elements, let's remember the four Vs of data, right? The velocity, veracity, right? The volume of data, the way the data comes in, right? All of that has to be taken into account. At the same time, there are certain systems where you get, uh, where there is no mechanism of retry. You cannot get, if the data that the source system has sent across to you, if it is lost, right? There is no way of recovering back because these source systems don't just apply data to our client, but they supply data to other automobile manufacturers, right? These are OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, basically who part on that this is the part information that has gone through. The data can come through SFTPs, APIs, they can be real-time or queue-based. Each and every interface has their own. And of course, we do have inter interactions where you actually communicate directly with the database to pull that information out, right? Uh, looking at geographies, it was North America, Asia, Europe, South America, China, all of these have to be taken into account. And, and, and we will show how the milestones have been laid out where we are going from one region to other and uh, how the systems expand to, account it, uh, to take into account uh, these places. And of course, the key part, consolidate their finance and general ledgers, procurement and billing into a single system. They need to see where the money is coming and where the, com and the money is going. Now, how we did that is basically, as I a, as a called out, we built up ARTs, right? And when we organize the value streams around it, right? This is, this is the way we basically realize the promise of delivering the value by building interfaces, right? They're building the interfaces which extract, transform, and, and map and force the data into target systems and this was done iteratively over the period of, uh, we have been doing this for the last one and a half years, and it's going to go for another two years. Now the PI planning, the standard, the standard process of running a PI planning, okay, that is, that is something that was done, but with COVID coming in, we leveraged all the uh, collaborative tools to actually do the PI planning. But what we did in addition to that is, each and every PI planning was, normally you have single PI planning, we divided that into different buckets, and the PI planning was controlled by the individual PDOs. By which who, which had the original project charter as to what they need to do, right? And then of course leveraging the lean portfolio, right? Now while doing all of this on this particular slide, I would rather actually bring your attention only to uh, to a couple of ones, right? Uh, most of it is standard, which basically TAS as a platform gives us out of the box that you can leverage and build out those services out of it. But the key one was error handling and tra and and uh, tracking framework. This is where we basically move away from the standard paradigm of having a high available system to a fault tolerant system. Because the exceptions, as you understand, are business exceptions or technical exceptions. And how do you handle that? Some things can be retried on their own, but when the source system will not be able to send you the data, right? you should be able to track it and replay that. Okay. And, uh, the key parts out here, looking at the task services, right? Uh, using auto scalers to manage the application scalability, but at the same time, having the error handling framework, which was custom built out uh, by the client and us together to have uh, reliability and scalability on, on, on replaying the instructions and, and giving it out, not going back to the source system, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, not going back to the source system, right? Now looking at uh, most of the runtime, it is Spring, Spring Boot based applications right? and, and primarily using config servers and service registry and circuit, circuit breakers to switch between various versions of the APIs at the same time falling back to the legacy systems, right? Uh, 
Now, uh, the another key reason why we, why we why we leverage DAS as a part of this integration platform is that we wanted to have the capability, and the client wanted to have a capability that eventually, when the system goes live with the with the entire spectrum of, of uh, global uh, uh, regions. They wanted to have the flexibility by which they can actually deploy, build out these services and deploy it on any of the hyperscalers. So one of the aspects is basically deploying VMware tasks on a GCP or an AWS platform. Here in this case, uh, of course, it is it is mature enough on Azure also, but uh, uh, for this client, we have been targeting primarily on GCP and AWS and extending the, the, the apps by using BYO services, right? That's basically one of the task force services that allows you uh, to adopt uh, uh, multiple third-party services as a part of the platform. Okay, and uh, the rest of the uh, ten-factor applications and using API-first architecture, which gave us the ability to scale it out as and when we need. Over to you, Manoj. Yeah. Thanks, Siddharth. So Siddharth mentioned uh, our client you know, being the automotive client. You know, they were confronted with a huge challenge. They had to kind of build a kind of a, a middleware or an integration platform uh, that can not only handle huge volumes of data, because typically all these automotive clients, as Siddharth mentioned, you know, deals with a lot of this vehicle information, part information, right? So volume was one of the key. The other thing was these uh, spikes that they would have, you know, monthly, whenever there is a huge chunk of data that will flow through this middleware system. So they were actually looking to build something that can not only handle high volumes, can basically scale up to the spikes that they would see. And also a system that is very stable because these are very, very core sensitive data that they would want to basically handle, right? And after a lot of these deliberations and discussion, finally the client uh, kind of decided that they would go with Tanzu application service. Now, obviously uh, the the architecture of choice was basically build a microservice-based architecture uh, using Spring Boot as the technology. So the, at the core of it, if you see over here, there are three major components. On the left, what you see is basically the source system, or what we call basically is the different data elements that we support. In the middle, what you see is basically the core, which is basically our middleware or the integration platform. And on the right, what you see is basically the target system. So what we are actually integrating with is basically S4 HANA, the Informatica MDM, Ariba to some extent, and, and also the ISS. Now just double clicking on, on the source system, you see that basically we're supporting four different type of uh, the end system, source system. Obviously these automated systems have, a lot of them are on legacy mainframe systems and they develop a lot of this data and generate it in file. So the vast majority of our interfaces that we build supports a file-based transmission. Then there's also uh, databases that we directly invoke to basically pull the data. A lot of this data is also, again, in, in gigabits and terabits. They, we also had to support kind of a messaging queue because some of the systems do basically push their data through the messaging system. And also the API C where we had to basically integrate with uh, their API gateway, right? And, and on the middle, this is the where the core where we had to basically build the different APIs that basically pulls this information from these source systems and finally ships it over to S4. Now, if you look at it, there are different categories of APIs that we have, uh, you know, meeting all of these individual business units. And along with this API, obviously there is a security layer that has to go along with it. And also the caching that you would need to provide in order for basically any of these enterprise systems. And so while some of the, you know, within the, the task, the applications can scale, but the end systems potentially may not scale up to the level of task. So we had to introduce some kind of a throttling mechanism also to make sure that the end system is basically able to grab and handle the data as it comes in. Um, along with uh, you know, any typical microservice-based architecture that we deploy on tasks, um, there are you know, some of the core and third-party services that we have used, um, RabbitMQ being one of them, Redis for caching, um, auto-scaling, which has worked really well in our case, uh, we've used that extensively and we were able to basically auto scale. We had seen instances where we basically, you know, it was able to handle volumes up to like 30 million to basically 60 million records at certain times, right? And all the auto scaling rules basically work very, you know, perfectly without any issues. We also use uh, Spring Cloud Config pretty much for basically, you know, storing and pulling all the uh, configuration related items. Um, as Sid alluded to, uh, one of the things that you know, the client was looking for is kind of a custom error handling framework. 
Now that's something that you typically do not get with a lot of these off the shelf uh, windware components. So this is something that we actually built on top. And this kind of allows our client to handle any of the transaction that would have failed. Normally with any typical uh, kind of an integration platform you would not get, but this is something that was custom built and which worked very seamlessly with the Tanzu application service. Um, in addition to that, you know, all the logging and monitoring capabilities, um, you know, typically that is provided was also basically embedded in, in the middle of the So in a sense, uh, using a task, you know, our client was basically able to build the kind of system that they really wanted that could basically cater to not only a small region, but you know, for the entire you know, the global region. Uh, next slide, sir. Yeah, so this is basically, again, uh, just double clicking on, on the architecture as I spoke about. Uh, you can see on the left are different uh, kind of connectors that we have built. Typically in any uh, integration platforms, you will have these kind of connectors. So these are some of the connectors that we had built, uh, which run seamlessly on task to connect to various different uh, sources. And then you have these microservices, which are basically API built on using Spring Boot, which essentially transfers the data uh, back to S4. And we also integrated uh, with different um, S3 storage. You'll see over here, it's a Delicia storage that we typically use, but uh, essentially we could basically have any of the uh, you know, S3 systems. Um, at the bottom, you see the different um, services and that we basically integrated with, uh, which seems to work you know, perfectly seamlessly fine. Uh, I'll just Thanks, a little bit Sorry. on the uh, DevOps um, as well, because uh, you know what, what we basically believe in is basically quality uh, should not be an afterthought. Uh, it should be something that is closely integrated into your dev process. So right from the beginning, and when we conceive this architecture, you know, we build all our um, CI/CD pipelines, make sure that uh, you know we have all the quality checks uh, in place, so that when we actually deploy the code. Not only that, you know, it has been quality tested, but it is actually, you know, in prime for production. Um, so, you know, right from, you know, sonar, I mean, to do any of the state static code analysis, or basically, you know, check mark or FOSA, to basically identify any of the security vulnerabilities. All of these are kind of, you know, built in, into the pipelines, which, uh, you know, seamlessly hook up to the tasks. Um, and we had uh, major releases um, and, uh, with the uh, green, Blue green deployments and you know seamlessly work for us. Um, and then um, so Sid is going to basically also talk about some of the uh, you know major accomplishments and what's the roadmap look like. But pretty much uh, you know the, the summary from an architecture perspective is that tasks can actually scale uh, for any kind of you know high volume you know requirements or applications you know that we usually have. And it worked perfectly for us uh, you know as 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 a bit. What you said. Awesome, awesome. Okay, so uh, a, a small deep dive on some of the services uh, that uh, have been uh, described by Manoj in the various architectures patterns out there. The first one, basically, the message broker, right? Uh, which which we understand, but uh, instead of deep diving that, let's talk about basically VMware Tanzu's RabbitMQ for VMs. Now, the 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 primary reason of building it out is one uh, is not the error handling framework, but basically having a place where we can store messages coming out from external systems, which actually pump the messages at a very rapid pace. When I say pump at a very rapid pace, you can have a spike of up to about five or 6 million transactions coming out within an hour's time. Not everything is required by the system to be processed. So we have to filter it out. So this is basically one way of throttling that we don't basically spike out just because of the input volume is high, that we don't start spinning out a lot of services based on the depth of the queue and then discard those messages because they don't align with the requirements that we have. But at the same time, basically, there is a way that we can always go back and replay that. Uh, the core services, Spring Cloud Services, Manoj fairly explain, uh, gave a, a fairly deep explanation as to why we are using that. It basically has helped out in a blue-green deployment with config service and circuit breakers. We can have multiple versions of the API, multiple versions of the API, not just for a single region, but basically be able to switch between a V1 or a V2 API, depending upon the geolocation for where the request is coming through. 
right? Uh, Memory-based auto-scaling, which you talked about, uh, that is the, the, the other part, which is not from the message broker side where we're looking at QTIP, but here in this case, it is more with respect to the volume. There have been month and month and situations where the input file, where uh, the source system is FTP, sends us a huge chunk of file and we have to scale it up before we actually start processing it. So those are the things that are available with core services. All of these are out of the box from VMware Tanju, but the, the key part here is that these have been decided even before the team started the build out. Right, that's basically where the the power of a product based organization or product based delivery model helps us in preempting the changes, aligning with the with the, with the uh, with the release train, having the spikes running up in advance so that you have re repeatable patterns and features ready for the product based teams to take it up for consumption. So it's basically a, a small agile organization within the entire delivery spectrum. Third party brokers, we just covered that. Basically one of the key one is GCP service broker, but also with the fact that we should be able to deploy this on the target hyperscaler platform. The client has GCP and AWS both is decided, but I think shifting towards GCP right now. And uh, logging and monitoring, uh, leaving the main part aside, which is standard. The key here is that we actually built out SRE, the site reliability engineering, SRE dashboards using Grafana and Prometheus. It basically not just provides the traceability of what's happening, but at the same time gives us hooks by which the error handling framework that was built out can be triggered for by the by the users to replay or re-trigger a service. If it is primarily a technical problem, so they can just replay that. But if it's a business problem, they have an, they have a visibility of what needs to be done and how they can correct it. Okay. Now, uh, what were the accomplishments? I think uh, I'll skip the last part. I think we have already uh, talked about it a lot in, in different aspects that what the error handling framework provides us, but the key, uh, but the other aspects is on the scalability side, right? Uh, as as Manoj said, it basically we have seen that at the at the end of month when we have spikes, the systems the system is able to scale. The scalability factors is not just on the memory part. We look at memory, we look at input files, we look at queue sizes, and these are all decided based on the different types of interfaces. Every interface their own characteristics and parameters by which it scales out. Uh, the cloud build integration model. One of the key aspects out here is what we leveraged. Uh, what we leveraged was the blue green deployment. This system cannot go down. Right. There is there is no downtime available. Uh, when we say no downtime available, it's basically I'm talking about including weekends, because your your general ledger and financials, of course, on a weekend it may not be required, but this but your inventory management is required because you need to forecast what is the demand and the system is able to tell, which is basically used internally down the line, to to automatically raise the demand and send it out. Right. And, and uh, that's that's basically what the the, the cloud-based integration, the key aspect that uh, that we have been able to leverage, right? On the open source, containerized DevOps platform, that's true. Basically, this this particular DevOps platform, of course, it has as was shown by Manoj in the previous slide that it uses different services available. They are containerized. It can be deployed in any environment, and the same time, it actually happens. The deployment happens not on a weekend. The deployment in our case, uh, in in many of the situations, happens during the day, within the week. It gets deployed, there is no downtime. Now, going further is where we are, right? So starting from milestone one, so this entire program is, is, is going to be implemented over, oh, this is basically a three to four years roadmap. It was supposed to be a two years roadmap, but due to COVID, we had to stretch it out because of uh, the gen gender, the problem that the uh, the global uh, globally everybody faced, but we are going through multiple milestones, starting out from just source source systems of integrating just six source systems with two app instances, taking up a, a, a maximum volume of 20K transactions per day to about 1,000 transactions per day. If you go on to the milestone number five, we are looking at 300 source systems to be integrated. Now, these each line items are individual milestones. It's not a cumulative one. What we will be there at the end of milestone number five is 650 systems, right, which will be integrated using 270 app instance, right, and approximately the same number of uh, services which are uh, which are registered within these app instances, and processing a daily volume of uh, in the range of over 20 to 85 million transactions per day. Right? The this this particular goal that has been achieved has primarily driven out because of two. One is the platform of choice, uh, the task platform, its services. 
and it's out of the box features. And the second one is primarily the way we had to customize our agile processes, not the standard safe or less process that you talk about, but basically driving, driving a product-based uh, implementation, having your, your uh, agile principles running within the PDO itself with an overarching agile release train that is managing and coordinating things across. And that's the end. Thank you. I think we will catch up on the Q and A section. Manoj and Sid, thank you so much for your talk. I invite everybody to jump on over to their Q and A over in Slack. We can keep this conversation going. I did want to mention that Deloitte is a great longtime partner of VMware's and a platinum sponsor of Spring One, and we could not pull off a show like this without our sponsors. Very generous support, and we appreciate the talk that you just just gave and um, we'll, we'll all be back here in a few minutes for our next session.